This interview is with U.S. Senator John McCain on January 29, 2003 in Washington, D.C. My name is Michelle Kelly and I'm the Director of Oral History for the Battleship Massachusetts. And we are an official partner of the Veterans Oral History Project at the Library of Congress. I'd like to start by asking you a few questions about your background. Could you state your full name and title? Uh, John Sidney McCain, uh, United States Senator from Arizona. And where and when were you born? August 29, 1936 in Cocosola, Panama. Being that your father and grandfather were both four-star admirals, did you always feel that a life that you were bound for life in the Navy? I, I, I believe so. I resisted it from time to time, but uh, I was pretty sure that was what was going to happen. Where were you when President Kennedy was assassinated and what were your thoughts? I was at uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia, uh, in a house that uh, three other bachelors and I were living in, and I happened to be at home. And um, I was watching television and, of course, uh, heard the news. And I think my uh, emotions were very similar to the majority of Americans, shock, sorrow, anger, uh, but mostly shock. What lessons did Annapolis teach you about character and integrity that have stayed with you? I think that over time, a school like the Naval Academy instills in you certain principles, uh, adherence to a certain code of honor, dependence on your comrades, the class system where you're loyal to your classmates, and then, uh, of course, a uh, a reverence for and a desire to emulate uh, leaders that you're taught about while they're John Paul Jones, uh, Bull Halsey, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, um, tho those kinds of people. I think uh, over the four-year period it's sort of ingrained in you. What made you choose to be a Navy pilot? Uh, I thought it was the most glamorous and exciting life that any that any person could ever choose. That was always my goal. And my grandfather had been an aviator as well. Before you actually went to Vietnam, what did you know about the war through the media and through the military? I didn't know a lot. Uh, I read uh, about the various conflicts uh, and the battles that had taken place, and I was aware of the gradual escalation. But uh, like most Americans, I had never heard of the 1954 uh, agreements in Geneva that divided North and South Vietnam. I didn't have any knowledge of the background and history of the Vietnamese people. I believed that it was the classic struggle between communism and freedom. Referring to the time before you were taken prisoner, how did the actual experience of being in Vietnam differ from what you had imagined it would be? My views about the the conflict were not affected uh, in any way that I can remember, but the futility of the way we were carrying on the air war w became more and more apparent. We'd watch the Russian freighters pull into Haiphong Harbor, unload the SAM-3 missile, SAM missiles and truck them up to, and put them in place. We couldn't touch them, and then they'd be fired at us. Um, that kind of war, targets picked by Lyndon Johnson in the basement of, of the White House. I remember one target I had one day was a place that had been bombed numerous times before, and 100 yards away was a bridge. Couldn't strike the bridge, but could make the concrete bounce um, <coughs> at the target that I was assigned. It was foolish, and all of us who were flying there knew it was foolish, and it was worse than that in many respects because so many of my uh, squadron mates and air wing mates were shot down and killed and captured. What was a typical day like at Yankee Station? Um, there was periods on Yankee Station where we had just sort of routine launches every hour and 40 minutes where you'd get probably a couple of sorties a day where you'd go out in two or four airplanes on very specific targets. The other was when we were in the kinds of operations we called alpha strikes, and that would be once a day and maximum of twice a day, where all, practically all the air, air wing would be launched at one time, we'd rendezvous, and then go and strike a major target, usually up around Hanoi or the Haiphong area. 
on the day I was shot down, for example, it was the thermal power plant in, in Hanoi that we were striking, which was in downtown Hanoi. Those kind of strikes required m very large numbers of airplanes, sometimes even joining up with the air wings from other aircraft carriers that were on station as well. Can you tell me about the, the fire aboard the Forrestal? Uh, we were preparing for an alpha strike, and, we were, and there was a large number of airplanes, and I was in mine, um, uh, had started the engine, was going through the engine checks. Across the flight deck from me was an F-4 Phantom, and on the Phantom wings were Zuni rockets, which are long, six-foot-long rockets. And the procedure that's required uh, on board safety procedures is that there's a what we call a pigtail, which is an electrical connection that goes to the rear end of the rocket. And the way the rocket is fired is an electrical impulse fires the, goes through that and, and, and fires the rocket. Well, that pigtail, as it's called, is not supposed to be inserted until the airplane is on the catapult facing the water. Those rules were violated, unfortunately, that day, and the um, pigtail was inserted in the Zuni rocket, and as the uh, pilot went from external power, which is what's used to start the engine of the airplane, much like a commercial airliner, to internal power, which means that you use the power from the, uh, you're not dependent on the outside source of electricity anymore, um, a very large vol uh, charge of stray electricity went to the pigtail and fired the Zuni rocket across the flight deck punched through the fuel tank, the 200-gallon fuel tank that was underneath my A4 Skyhawk, and continued on. Flame, the fuel spilled out naturally, and the fuel was on fire. And in a very short period of time, there was a huge conflagration on, on the forest hall, which ended up taking the lives of 135 young sailors, and took about 12 to 18 hours, depending on how you look at it, to, to put the fire out. I shut down the engine of my air, felt the shock. I was shut, saw the fire, jumped out of uh, by going out on the refueling probe. And all this is on film, by the way, because it was uh, we had constant filming of the flight deck and, and rolled through the fire and went across the other side of the flight deck saw people running around, saw a number of things, including people with a fire hose, and I saw the pilot plane next to mine jump out of his airplane only. He didn't jump as far, and when he rolled out, he was on fire, and I started towards him just as I did. The first bomb blew off and uh, knocked me back, and then other bombs started going off, and that's when the conflagration started. I would say there was couldn't have been more than about two minutes between the time that that my airplane was hit by the Zuni rocket until the time that the first bomb went off, which then complicated the disaster dramatically, of course. Between that, that incident and the two plane crashes that you were in, did you ever feel superstitious? Oh, I'm only superstitious. I'm very superstitious, yes. And then going on the Oriskany, because didn't that have a history of... Uh, yeah, the the Oriskany had the highest losses of any air wing in, uh, in the Vietnam conflict. Yeah. Did you do things to, um, being superstitious, did you do things for good luck? Yeah, and I'm sorry because um, I always had this, um, on the forest hall there was a, a young, uh, what we call parachute rigger, the guy in the squadron that takes care of the pilot's equipment. And I always kind of had this view that my visor needed to be cleaned. And so after my plane was started and after I was ready to go, I would always hand my helmet down to him and he would clean the visor off and, and give it back to me and put it on. And uh, I had just gotten the helmet back from him after he cleaned the visor and put it on and when the first, when the rocket hit. And unfortunately, we never saw him again, unfortunately. But I still am uh, one who tries to avoid stepping on a crack and will pick up a penny if the head's up and all of those things. Can you describe the circumstances under which you were taken prisoner by the Vietnamese? 
Well, we were striking the uh, Hanoi Thermal Power Plant. Uh, it was a very large airstrike. Uh, we came in. There was heavy and concentrated uh, both uh, anti-aircraft fire and surface-to-air missiles were everywhere. At that time, Hanoi was the most heavily defended uh, place in history. And as I rolled in to, the, to bomb the target, um, I uh, uh, rolled in and sighted on, on the thermal power plant, which sat on this, the end of a lake called Chukbak Lake, the western lake. And just as I released the bombs and started to pull back on the stick, a uh, surfaced air missile hit and took the uh, right wing off my airplane. My airplane violently gyrated. I ejected. As the airplane was going down, they were striking my knee on the canopy when I went out and uh, broke my arm as well, both my arms, and parachuted into a lake uh, called the Western Lake. I had some difficulty getting my life vest to inflate. I had to use my teeth to pull the toggle on it and after struggling around. And then when I floated to the surface, some Vietnamese came out and pulled me into shore. Uh, the crowd was rather angry, which is understandable, and uh, they hit me and just broke my shoulder with a rifle butt and bayoneted me a couple of times. And then army guys came and took uh, pictures of some woman giving me a cup of tea and threw me into the truck and took me to the Wallow Prison, which we know of as the Hanoi Hilton, an old French prison built by the French prison in downtown Hanoi. Can you tell me about living conditions at the Hanoi Hilton and how they changed after you refused early release? Conditions were very poor in the first few years. Um, guards were very tough. Uh, food was poor. A lot of dysentery. Um, I lived in most of the time in solitary confinement, although I was always in contact by tapping with other prisoners. Um, I was never beaten very badly up until the time I refused the early release. Uh, but after that, it was very severe for about eight or nine months um, as they attempted to get a war crimes confession out of me. Um, but after a while, I'd eased off some. And then after about middle to late 1970, uh, after Ho Chi Minh had died, our treatment changed for everybody and it improved rather dramatically. What kind of food did they give you? A soup twice a day, piece of bread usually, and soup was you three, four months a year it was a, a pumpkin soup, four months a year it was cabbage soup, and four months a year it was a greens kind of a thing that looked like clipped grass. Um, sometimes there would be some meat in it, uh, sometimes not. It was, that was basically our food. As I say, with the change in treatment, uh, the food improved significantly, though. Can you tell me why you refused early uh, release? Well, I was not in good shape. I knew that the Vietnamese thought I was an important prisoner because of my father being uh, an admiral and commander of U.S. forces in the Pacific. Um, um, it wasn't an easy decision because I was in very poor physical health. But I also knew the code of conduct said uh, sick and injured go first and then by order of capture. Everett Alvarez had been there three years before I ever got there. Uh, unfortunately, I did not have much communication except with the guy next in the cell next to me, so I had no contact with the senior ranking officer. But I made the decision that it was better for me to go home in order. I'm very happy I didn't know I was going to be there for another three years. The, did that have to do with um, like a code of honor? Well, the code of conduct, which was a result of the Korean War, which was our first experience with the, quote, brainwashing. Um, 37 Americans after the Korean War chose to live in China and not come back to the United States. The code of conduct was developed, and it says very clearly 
Um, I will not accept parole. Uh, I will go home in order of something. Go home in order of capture, except for those who are sick and injured. So it was very clear in the code of conduct. The question was, how sick and injured was I? And um, man, that was a bit of a question. So wisest decision I, that I ever made. You referred to many POWs by name in, in your book. Um, how many of these men did you actually have the opportunity to communicate with directly while in prison? Well, during the first few years, very few. Only those around <clears throat> the cells around me because we were kept either in solitary confinement or two to a cell. Uh, later on, when we were put in large rooms of 25 to 30 POWs in each, I got to know very well, maybe about 40 or 50 POWs. In Faith of My Fathers, you referred to being interviewed by a Cuban doctor, Fernando Burrell. I don't mm -hmm. know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but I'm um, posing as a psychiatrist and the presence of Cuban torturers um, in the Hanoi Hilton. Did you have any other contact with Cubans in Vietnam? No. And I didn't, fortunately, have contact with the Cuban interrogators. They were in another camp, but the people who were there said they were extremely brutal. What kind of relationship did Dr. Burrell appear to have with the North Vietnamese? It's hard for me to tell. Obviously, he was a guest of the North Vietnamese, but, uh, you know, it was one of these things where they took me in a jeep and blindfolded, and I walked into this room, sat out, and talked to the guy for about a 15 minutes or so and left, so... Um, when I was reading your book, I was surprised at how much humor was used by you and by the other POWs. Um, can you tell me about the role that humor plays in those humor situations? Humor is vital to, to one's resistance and mental stability. We used to play this program that we called Hanoi Hannah. That was a radio program every morning and every evening. And it was always entertaining and to make fun of the guards rather than be fra afraid of them. And, we called the camp commander Slopehead, and we would give different names to different guards. It's very important. Communication is absolutely essential. A sense of humor is very important. If you don't have that, you have a tendency to your captor to become larger and larger and more and more powerful, and therefore you're more and more intimidated. If you laugh at them, then it puts them back to their, their actual size. You said when you first got there, um, when you, were, you uh, weren't treated quite as ex in such extreme violence as some of the other mm -hmm. POWs because of your father's position, um, and so you acted out more? What, in what ways did you? Or you were more reckless, that's the word you used? Uh, yeah, because I wasn't punished as badly as others when I would be communicating or talking back to the guards. Uh, that was a luxury that I enjoyed until the time I refused to be released. How much did you know about the progress of the war while you were a prisoner? We, we knew more by omission than commission. For example, I remember hearing night after night about how Kaysan was going to fall, that the Marines were surrounded, they had no chance. And then one night we didn't hear about Kaysan anymore, uh, which clearly indicated to us that <laughs> it had not fallen. Uh, so, and the re most of the rest of it was just such blatant propaganda that you just dismissed it. And so it was hard to know you know what was going on. What we really didn't appreciate, because we blocked out most of the information, was how strong the anti-war movement had become in the United States. Uh, that came as a great surprise to us. When I was shot down in 1967, the anti-war movement was, you know, just a, another irritant. And so it was hard for us to imagine how divisive the war had become in our society until we came out. It was probably my greatest surprise. How did you first find out about that? Well, they told us all the stuff, you know, but we didn't believe it. I mean, they would, whatever, anywhere in the world someone burned an American flag, they would, we, we would hear about it. But we dismissed it as just, communist propaganda. It wasn't until we got out and found out that uh, it really was one of the most divisive crises in the history of our country. What were some of the traits of your fellow prisoners that you admired most? Courage, 
ingenuity, humor. I was privileged to observe a thousand acts of courage and compassion and love. It's a great honor of my life. Can you tell me about your release from the prison camp and how you adjusted to everyday life back in the United States? The Vietnamese uh, divided us up into different camps uh, in groups of when we had been shot down because the releases were, first group released with the earliest shot down, Alvarez and company, and second group, third group, I think there were like five groups, over a period of about three months. And Vietnamese came and gave us shoes, they gave us pants and a shirt, and uh, food obviously was, was really dramatically good, first time we had stuff to read. And one day they took us outside of the camp and we got onto buses and the buses uh, went to the airport uh, uh, in Hanoi and we got off the buses and there was a table with Vietnamese and Americans. They called out your name and you went forward. American greeted you and you walked and got on the airplane. We went to and spent about three days in the Philippines where they, we got you know initial physical exams and uh, that kind of thing and then flew back to the to the places that we had been stationed uh, when we had shot down. In my case, it was Jacksonville, Florida. And it took me about 45 minutes to adjust. I've never had a nightmare. I've never had a flashback. I've never had any difficulties at all, some physical difficulties, obviously. But it didn't, it didn't take me any time at all to adjust. The last uh, couple of years, we were together in groups, and we did a lot of things from history classes and mathematics to putting on plays and skits and movies and playing cards and so you know it wasn't as if I just walked out of three years of solitary confinement into the outside world so it didn't take most of us long at all. What experiences prompted you to um, go into politics? My last job in the Navy was the Navy liaison officer to the Senate, a small office in the Russell Senate office building. I and a then Marine Major Jim Jones, who later became the Commandant of the Marine Corps and now is the head of NATO, um, uh, and I worked uh, there and I got interested in the political process because I observed it here. I saw how impactful a hard-working, dedicated, knowledgeable member of the Senate can be, so I aspired to be one. What do you consider to be some of your major successes as a public servant? Uh, passage of the campaign finance reform law was probably one of the major achievements, um, but I've been involved in a host of national security issues. As chairman of the Commerce Committee, I've been involved in many of the telecommunications, aviation, transportation issues. I was one of the authors of the Transportation Security Act, which, you know, post 9-11. Um, and I think we've tried to take care of our constituents who need help. I'm very proud of that. So, you know, I, normalization of relations with Vietnam is something that I'm proud of. You refer to Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls. Um, how do you feel that your life um, and your public service has um, gone according to the philosophies extolled in, in that book? Well, Robert Jordan, Hemingway's hero in protagonist in For Whom the Bell Tolls was a man who was dedicated, selfless, brave, capable, but also stoic. Um, he recognized that the cause he served was a flawed one, but he still served it to the point where he was willing to sacrifice his life, even if not only the cause, but the particular enterprise, the blowing of a bridge, <clears throat> blowing up of a bridge, would have no effect on the conflict. He still went out and did it, and then was willing to to sacrifice his very life, and his final words were, the world is a fine place and worth the fighting for, and I'll hate very much to leave it. What, do, what is your idea of, of honor and from, um, from your 
father and from your grandfather? My idea of honor is to serve a cause greater than your self-interest. And there's lots of good causes, and you can serve them in many ways. You don't have to serve them in the Spanish Civil War, as Robert Jordan did. You can serve them in your own community and even in your own home. You told the story of your father's presence at Operation Torch during World War II and um, on, on the submarine gunnel. Um, did he ever mention seeing the USS Massachusetts, which was also there? You know, I think he, I'm sure he did, but I, I honestly don't remember. Is there anything else that we should talk about? No, I, except to say that, uh, that I've been very fortunate in, in my life. I think I'll probably, I'm probably the luckiest person that you will ever interview. I survived many near-death experiences. I've had the privilege of serving the country now for 22 years in the Navy and now 22 years, nearly 22 years in the Congress of the United States. And uh, I've had opportunities to see and be involved in some important moments in the history of our country and played a very, very small role in our country's great story. And uh, so I think that I'm really the most fortunate person that I've ever known or heard of and truly blessed. I do have one more question for you, mm -hmm. and that is, um, what do you think about um, our current involvement in um, the possibility of going to war with Iraq? I think it's very likely that we will be in a conflict. I think it'll be brief. I think we will win with a minimum of casualties, although any casualty is a tragedy. And I think we have the opportunity to put a democratic form of government in Iraq and end a very brutal, oppressive regime on the Iraq people of Iraq. So I regret that we have to do this because we will lose American lives. But at the same time, I think there's a possibility of doing great and wonderful things. Well, thank you very much, Senator. Thank you. Thank you for having me on.